For those of you that enjoy horror-related content, YouTube can be an amazing place to find it. It seems that horror videos right now are a dime a dozen, and as someone who frequently collabs on other channels, I can tell you from personal experience that horror-related videos and stories can be taken down just as easily as they're put up, whether through channels being deleted or the content creator simply taking them down. I've personally collaborated on multiple channels, only to find after a while that some of the videos I had recorded for are now missing. So unless you saw the videos when they first came out, they would now appear to be lost to the black hole of YouTube. That is, until today. I'm Fearcrawler, and welcome to Volume 1 of something I'd like to call The Lost Recordings. Enjoy. I have never told anyone what really happened to my brother when the sickness came to our small Appalachian town in the summer of 81. I was the only one who knew the truth, but I never said a word, and I was asked a lot. First, I was questioned by the sheriff, who was, Just trying to get to the bottom of things, young lady. This was followed by an awkward, one-sided conversation with an official from the CDC then a real interrogation from the team of FBI agents who were brought in to help with the investigation. They even grilled my parents, who had been out of town when it arrived. After what felt like hours, a nice psychologist from social services took one look at me and declared that I was in shock, which was understandable given the circumstances, and insisted I be left alone until I was ready to talk about it. I thought I would never be ready to talk about it, mostly because they would never be ready to hear it. But that was before. Now, more than 30 years later, the time has come. I should tell someone what happened while I still can. You see, I have had a fever for three days now. Stop rolling your eyes. I am aware that a fever is no real cause for concern in a healthy adult, but this is something different. For the last 72 hours, my temperature has held steady at exactly 102.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You think I probably just need to replace the battery in the old digital thermometer, right? Well, I did that. And then I used an old school glass and mercury thermometer, a plastic fever strip, and an electronic ear thermometer. And they all reported the same temperature. 102.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Every single time. You do not know the significance of this yet, but you will. Let us take a six-day journey to Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, in the year 1981. Day one. It was hotter than hell when I woke up, the plastic box fan on the floor rattling as it moved hot air from one side of my room to the other. The light shining through the windows told me I'd woken up later than usual. But there was no one there to nag me about it because mom and dad had been on the road since before dawn, hauling a load of cattle up I-64 to the stockyards in Louisville. I figured Andrew had probably slept in as well. But when I walked past his room on the way to the kitchen, I was surprised to see the door open and bed neatly made. I decided he must have gone with mom and dad so he could walk around the city while they did business. I was excited to have the whole day to myself. It didn't happen very often, so I planned to fill my day by swimming at the creek and eating way too many of my mom's apricot hand pies. It was as glorious as it sounds. Later that night, I was making myself pancakes for dinner when I decided to turn on the radio. It only picked up a few stations, all of which could be divided into two categories, classic country or evangelical preacher damning sinners to hell. As comical as the latter could be at times, I was shooting for the former. I did not get either. I got static. I had to roll the dial up and down the line with careful precision at least four times before I got anything close to a broadcast. Well, hey there, folks. You're listening to 102.6, The Fever, playing all your favorites from the 60s, 70s, and today. Where did you come from? I whispered, a smile spreading across my face. Up next, we've got...
got a little Donna Summer for you, followed by the Go-Go's, and trust me when I say, their lips are sealed. But first, a message from our sponsors. I shuffled back to the stovetop to flip my momentarily forgotten pancake, when an odd series of beeps, bells, and buzzes erupted from the radio's modest speakers. I froze, mid-flip, focusing on each individual sound, picking out the pattern straight away. I was just beginning to make sense of the sequence, when Andrew charged into the kitchen, yanked the plug from the outlet, and threw the radio across the room. When it continued to produce those enthralling sounds, he smashed it against the floor a dozen times and chucked the pieces out into the yard. What the hell, Drew? I asked, affronted. What the hell right back at you, sis? He snapped, nudging me out of the way so he could tend to the smoking mess on the stove. I glanced at the melted spatula in my hand and wondered how long I had been standing there. I guess I spaced out for a minute, huh? I said with a nervous laugh. What are you even doing here anyway? I thought you went with mom and dad. Andrew kept his back to me, taking his sweet time rinsing out the skillet and scraping the charred clump of pancake into the trash can. Well, I asked, crossing my arms and tapping my foot to emphasize my impatience. I went out to the barn around 7 this morning to feed. Thought I ought to check on Hickory too. She's about done cooking. We ought to have a foal by the end of the month, he said, still not turning to look at me. That was like 12 hours ago. Where have you been all day? She had some tangles and burrs in her mane, and she's just so fat and miserable right now I decided to spend an hour or so giving her a good brushing. Thought I'd listen to the radio while I worked. It was already tuned into that new station when I turned it on, so I just left it there, he said, pausing to clear his throat. So, he continued, one minute I'm digging out the curry comb, listening to Jessie's girl, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up on the barn floor, hours later, to the sound of that weird racket blaring through the speakers. I don't know what's going on, sis, but I feel like absolute shit. And don't ask me how, but I know it has something to do with that damned radio station. He finally turned to face me, and that's when I noticed that he looked like absolute shit as well. His eyes were roomy and bloodshot, his dark hair damp with sweat emphasizing the sickly pallor of his skin. I didn't need to touch him to know he was burning up with a fever. That would explain why he was talking like a maniac. Maybe you should go lie down, Andrew, I suggested, and he nodded. Want me to warm up some soup for you? Sure, that sounds pretty good. Just a sec, I said when he started toward his bedroom. I want to take your temperature. Andrew stood, leaning against the counter for support while I dug the thermometer case out of the junk drawer. I shook it until the red line was under the 95 mark, then shoved it under his tongue. I counted to 60 in my head and said, All right, let's take a look. I held it up to the light and the results were just what I expected. Yep, I said, matter-of-factly. You've got a fever. Pretty good one, too. How high is it? he asked narrowing his eyes at me. Almost 103, I said, rinsing off the thermometer before tossing it back in the case. What was it exactly? Hmm, looked to be about 102.5 or 6, I replied with a shrug. You should probably take some aspirin. Nah, I'll be fine. I'm going to bed. Uh, don't worry about the soup. See you in the morning, he said, tossing my hair. That was the last coherent conversation I had with my brother. Day 2 I woke up on the couch the next day, a painful crick in my neck. I had been waiting up for mom and dad to let them know Andrew was sick, but I must have fallen asleep before they made it back. Mom? I called out, wondering why she hadn't shooed me off to bed when she and dad got home last night. No response. Mom? Dad? Anybody home? Silence. I had a bad feeling. But when I opened the side door and noticed the truck and trailer were still gone, I was slipping into full-on panic territory. I barged into Andrew's room to see if he had heard from mom or dad, but just like the day before, his bed was made and he was gone. 
I went straight to the kitchen and grabbed the phone book to look up the non-emergency number for the police department. I willed my hands to stop shaking long enough to dial the phone, and I held my breath when it started to ring. You have reached the county sheriff's office. Please be advised that as of 8 p.m. on July 23rd, the Centers for Disease Control have implemented a county-wide quarantine to prevent the spread of an unidentified communicable disease. All county access roads have been closed until further notice. Any individuals found in violation of the quarantine order will be detained. For your safety, the CDC have issued a boil water advisory for municipal water customers, as well as those residents who access water from private wells and springs. For more information, please tune in to X88.3 FM. The call disconnected at the end of the message. I was equal parts freaked out and relieved. Relieved because if the roads closed at 8 o'clock last night, that explained why mom and dad didn't make it home. Freaked out because, holy shit, a fucking quarantine? My next order of business was tuning into X88.3 FM for more information. I went out to the barn to find a working radio, but it would seem Andrew had smashed that one beyond repair as well. <sighs> awesome. I gave Hickory a pat, tossing a scoop of sweet feed in her trough before heading back outside. I was looking around the paddock for signs of Andrew, when I noticed a police car in the distance, stirring up a cloud of gravel and dust in its wake as it came down the road. I sprinted down the driveway and proceeded to stand in the middle of the road, waving my arms like a maniac. The car skidded to a halt a good five feet from where I stood, and Deputy Mills stuck his head out the window. What the hell are you doing, girl? Trying to get yourself killed? He barked. No, sir. Of course not. It's just that my brother is missing. All our radios are broken. I think my parents are trapped outside the quarantine, and I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing right now, I said, my eyes brimming with tears. He gave me a sympathetic sigh and motioned me closer to the car. Uh, look, don't cry. It makes me uncomfortable, he said point blank. The best thing you can do right now is to go back inside your house, lock the doors, and wait for the quarantine to pass. It shouldn't be longer than a few days. Don't let anyone in, not even if your brother turns up, okay? You don't look sick to me, but if you start to run a fever, you need to call the number on this card. I took the card from his outstretched hand, and I noticed he was careful not to touch me. Well, what'll happen then? I asked. The folks from the CDC will come take you to the facility they've set up inside the quarantine area, give you medical attention, see if they can figure out the source of the infection. I thought it was the water. That's just a standard precaution. Nothing has been ruled in or out yet. Now get inside and don't come back out until you hear it's all clear. We're updating the outgoing message at the station every day so you can check in there. Day 3 No change. No sign of Andrew. No word from mom or dad. The only difference on the outgoing message from the sheriff's office was the date. Day 4. See day 3. Day 5. I was officially stir-crazy. The only thing I did with regularity was feed the animals and check on hickory, but that only filled 15 minutes in a 24-hour day. So I cleaned. I knitted. Because you can never have too many scarves in July. And I paced around the house like a zombie. Day 6. I had taken to sleeping on the couch. I don't know why, but I just didn't feel safe in my room anymore. It was close to 10pm and I was curled up with one of my Nancy Drew books when I heard light knocking on the front door. I held my breath and didn't dare move. The knocking grew louder and louder, then turned to banging. I buried my head under the quilt and covered my ears. The banging stopped. I uncovered my ears and peeled back the quilt. There was a voice, so faint I could barely hear it, but unmistakably Andrew's. 
I slid from the couch to the floor and inched closer to the door until I could make out what he was saying. Don't open the door, sis, he pleaded. No matter what, don't let me in. Drew, I murmured. What's happening? Where have you been? It came through the radio, he rasped. The fever, 102.6. I can still hear it buzzing in my head. It's telling me to kill you. To kill everyone. You're not making any sense, Andrew, I cried. I only came back to warn you. I can't tune it out much longer. And then I won't be able to stop. Do you understand? I will kill you. I will kill everyone, he shouted, banging on the door. Drew, buddy, listen to me. I know where you can get some help. Deputy Mills gave me a number to call. It's the CDC. I'll call them right now, and they'll come get you. I heard strange laughter from the other side of the door. Andrew? Silence. Then all hell broke loose. Andrew started trying to kick the door in. You know I wish that I had Jesse's girl. He sang maniacally. I wish that I had Jesse's girl. Where can I find a woman like that? I retreated to the other side of the room, watching in horror as Andrew used his body like a battering ram and broke down the door. I ran to the kitchen, grabbing a butcher knife from the drawer, knowing full well I would never be able to use it to hurt my brother. It was fortunate for me that the thing that trudged into the kitchen after me looked nothing like my brother. Stay back, Andrew. I have a knife. I swear I'll use it, I threatened. And he did stop. He stood about a foot away from me, head cocked to the side like he was trying to make sense of something. He opened his mouth and I thought he was about to speak, but instead, out came a series of beeps, bells, and buzzes. That beautiful, familiar pattern. He was giving me another chance to figure it out. The sequence was so enticing I may have been lost forever had Hickory not chosen that exact moment to kick down her stall door and run through the yard, her nays sounding more like a human scream. I dropped the knife covered my ears and charged at Andrew, knocking him to the ground with surprising ease. I fled through the same door he'd broken down and ran for the main road. I ended up at one of the quarantine barricades, blubbering about my sick brother, and the CDC dispatched someone to my house immediately. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Turns out, they had been tracking him for days, as he was the last living carrier of the fever. Only they called it a mutated strain of Toxoplasma gondii. The next 12 hours were a blur of hazmat suits and decontamination chambers. The quarantine was lifted and I was reunited with my mom and dad who were devastated over the loss of their only son and fiercely protective of their remaining daughter. I've been in denial for 36 years. Convinced that everything I saw the night Andrew died was the product of a scared 15-year-old girl's imagination. But after what happened on Thursday, I can no longer afford the luxury of denial. You see, like any middle-aged liberal, I enjoy listening to NPR while I cook dinner. Only, when I switched on the radio that evening, instead of the dulcet tones of Audie Cornish, I heard... Hey there, folks. You're listening to 102.6, The Fever, playing all your favorites from the 90s, 2000s, and today. I woke up on the floor the next morning, and, well, you know the rest. My feet rest on solid ground, but my mind is far from easy. On the pathway to the edge of sanity, I approach the abyss, until standing on the brink, I am as vacuous as the unfathomable beyond. The savage wound gouged into the earth is terrible to behold, yet my eyes are drawn to inexorably probe the heart of darkness leading to the infernal depths of the mine. Even my eyes must travel lightly, for staring induces a pressure like a heavy object, tearing its way through a suspension of thin fabric. If you gaze long into the abyss, 
the abyss also gazes into you. I try to focus on the thick web of interlocking ground tunnels, chutes, and ore haulages that network across the chasm, but without fail my eyes return to the emptiness of the void. How quickly an awareness turns to a fear, and just as swift as fear transformed to a self-destructive fixation. Warm air rises from below as a lover's seductive whisper, and though I am mortified with terror at the prospect of falling, it's impossible to deny the liberation promised by that endless release. My name is Ender, or Sergeant Maston as I am referred to by my troop. I have been contracted to perform a security sweep of the Umpeneng Mine in South Africa, the deepest mine in the world. The squad was boisterous on the way here. No one has spoken a word since we've entered the parlance. We are lowered incrementally for the first few feet before the parlance is dropped to plummet downward at a sickening rate. It takes just six minutes to travel the first one and a half miles into the ground, and one of my men has already puked by the time the metal chain screeches and catches at the bottom. Out of respect for his dignity, I pretend not to notice the sound of his retching. From there we have to walk to a second shaft which takes us an additional mile downward to where stone walls can reach up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit and will immediately fry the oils in your skin if you are careless enough to make contact. The tunnels of Umpeneng gold mines spread nearly 300 miles, many of which have been infested with rogue miners and thieves who live down here for months at a time. A combination of poor nutrition, absence of sunlight, and refining gold with mercury and other toxins has turned these miners into pallid ghouls. The ghost miners we're hunting are difficult to locate, and often retaliate against their discovery with gunfire or explosives to demolish the tunnels. I never would have dared this expedition if we didn't already have someone on the inside. Ramos, one of the ghost miners who now accompanies us, has betrayed his operation for a prize of 10,000 US dollars promised upon our safe return. He sold us maps detailing the location of Esgengi, an elusive subterrain refinery of pirated gold maintained by one of the criminal syndicates. He walked at the forefront now, navigating the endless black corridors without hesitation. His ivory skin glowed with an almost internal radiance under our flashlights, a translucent sheen giving clear view to the blue veins in his neck and arms. I didn't take my eyes off him for a second. My finger hovered on the trigger of my M9 handgun. One wrong move and he would be buried deeper than the devil. I didn't discount the possibility that his allegiance was a ruse, and that rounding a blind corner we'd lose track of him, only to be buried in an immeasurable payload of rock. He kept glancing over his shoulder with great pale orbs that bulged from his emaciated face, constantly licking his lips against the dry air. His eyes traced the gun in my hand each time, fully understanding the risk he accepted in this undertaking. Close now. The words slipped past his darting tongue. Flashlights off. My hand tightened on the gun. You do not want them to see you coming. Ramos added impatiently. Tunnel collapse before you fire a shot. I go alone, give password, then come back for you. I looked back at my troop behind me. Six men, each putting their lives in my hands. Now Ramos was asking me to trust their lives with him as well. The more trust is spread, the thinner it becomes. But I couldn't see another option. I could almost hear the skin of my face cracking in the silence, and my eyes were so parched that I wondered if the fluid had begun to evaporate. What abominable conditions men will subject themselves to for gold. But how could I pretend that I was any better when I accepted the contract to come here? I relented and gave Ramos a curt nod. Speak loud, in English, I instructed him. We'll put out our lights, but you keep yours on. I didn't have to tell Ramos that I wanted his light on to make him easier to shoot in the back if he pulled anything funny. His maniacal grin told me that he already knew. Put your worries to bed, my friend. Ramos said, smiling with teeth as bleached as his skin. I need you more than you need me. I flashed the signal and the lights behind me cut with military precision. I turned mine out last, intent on Ramos's face for any sign of deceit. 
His fey countenance was impossible for me to read, however, and relinquishing my own light to the encompassing darkness felt like surrendering my soul to the mercy of a prayer. Ramos held his own light over his head to illuminate himself like an actor bearing the focus of a stage. He walked purposefully down the deserted way, humming to himself with careless ease. The proximity of the light gave his skin an even more pellucid shine, and for a second, I'm positive I could make out the contrast of his cervical spine and collarbone. As he moved away from us, the full weight of the darkness bore down upon me and the troop. The presence of the mountain of earth looming overhead had never felt more evident, and the atmospheric furnace which engulfed us filled our lungs and begged escape with each breath. No movement. No sound. Despite the intolerable conditions, my men held their composure while we bore out the pregnant silence. I couldn't help but grin at the mutual respect we all felt for each other. This wasn't the first group of pirates we'd brought down, and sure as hell, it wouldn't be the last. Ramos stopped about fifty yards down where the tunnel terminated in a blank wall. The void calls us to her. He articulated loudly, to no one in particular. And you will answer the call. A hundred years may rob from me those I love, my sight, and the very memory of my name, but no eternity will diminish the scar on my psyche that voice branded upon me. I can only imagine the universe being born in response to such a voice, and even more likely, will it end with the last reverberation of its utterance. The sudden silence after it faded was broken only by a uniform thud as the six men behind me fell to their knees as one. A similar compulsion gripped me as survival instincts lying dormant since the mankind's first sentient thought devoured my consciousness, but I stubbornly refused them to maintain my line of sight on Ramos. The ghost miner turned back and flashed his light in my direction, illuminating the gun still leveled at his face. I hoped the distance did not betray how violently my hands shook. But perhaps my authority was already robbed from the coward men behind me. What was that? I asked. What is down here? Come and see for yourself, Ramos replied. At my signal I heard my men return to their feet, although I didn't glance back at them lest I reveal the terror blazoned across my face. I flared my own light on the approach, crouching and pressing myself to the wall in a vain attempt to regain some control over the situation. The terminal end of the tunnel Ramos had stopped beside had vanished, replaced only by a black wall of empty darkness which my meager light could not hope to puncture. I turned the beam on Ramos instead, bringing to life the fleeting vision which had passed before. The light shone straight through his skin, my eyes traced the outline of bones, the suspension of his organs, and even the viscous fluid running sluggishly through his body. Back to his face. The cartilage of his nose and ears blocked the light more thoroughly, making them appear to hover distinctly apart from his leering skull. I ignored the horrified gasps from behind, and did not allow my men to see me falter. We have arrived at its gangi, Ramos said as we drew level with him. But I do have something to confess. If you believe you are being brought to a refinery, then I'm afraid you have been misled. I wanted nothing more than to plant a bullet straight through that sardonic grin, but years of violence and bloodshed as a mercenary soldier have taught me that the will to restraint is a more important lesson than knowing how to kill. I lowered my gun to the floor. If we had been afraid of death, we would have been shown it by now. Instead, I moved beside him to shine the light into the opening, revealing a descending stairway cut deeply into the solid bedrock. I don't know what bothered me more, that here at the bottom of the deepest mine on earth there was a secret passage that continued downward past all sight and reason, or that each step was worn smooth in two places as though eons of footsteps have passed up and down this way before. Asgongi, is the temple which lies well below us still? Ramos continued, each word shedding some of the accent and hesitation he previously decorated the English language with. The pretense was an unfortunate necessity for bringing you here, but the essence of your mission remains unchanged. I desire your assistance in eliminating the subterranean evil, just as you had already set out to do. 
I offer compensation for your service, just as you were prepared to receive. Both will be greater than you anticipated. Will you continue this way with me? There it was again. The whisper of the unknowable darkness. The temptation of the void which fixates my senses until sight and sound and touch all combine into a single insistent pressure to leap. The demands of my curiosity gripped my heart with iron claws, which dragged me toward the topmost stair. From the idle dreaming days in my youth to each operation in my professional career, I hungered for the insatiable thrill of adventure, and now faced with the greatest mystery of my life, my whole spirit was kindling to its fire. This is why it was so difficult to turn around, to bark the commands to follow my lead on the long trek back towards the mundane world above. For all the wonder promised by this discovery, so too was I filled with looming dread. For all the selfish longing of my desires, I could not purchase them with the lives of the men who trusted me. I do not wish to portray myself as a hero in this instance, because I swear to you I'm not. I have once knocked on the door where one of my men once lived, and eased his weeping mother to the ground in my arms. It was nothing but cowardice which made me unwilling to do so again. And of Maston. I could hear Ramos break his composure behind me. I need your help. It's good that I didn't turn around. If I had, then I might not have noticed the wooden support beams that were painted with a metallic gloss. I shouted a warning to my men, and as though thrown by the momentum of my words, an explosion ruptured from the ceiling. Splintering timbers like breaking bones heralded the shifting weight of untold millions of tons of rock and soil above. Perhaps we could have struggled through the hail before the avalanche of cascading rock blocked off the retreat. Again it was my cowardice though which lent strength to my desperate effort to pull my men back. Within seconds, all opportunity for a decision had passed. I'm sorry. Ramos moaned, a real tremor running through his woeful voice. I hadn't wanted to do that, but you've left me no other choice. I hope your surprise won't spoil the good fortune which has brought us together. Restraint saved his life for a second time. Somehow, I didn't expect it to be strong enough to endure a third test. Despite his apology, his skull was still grinning beneath his thin mask of skin. He must have known what I was thinking, because I wore the same expression as every man in my troop. There was no way onward but down. As our car made a right turn off the main highway and onto the old country road, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My heavy anticipation for where we were headed had been temporarily subdued by the tick-tock sound of the turn signal and the large, unique structure my mom and I were slowly driving by. My eyes were fascinatingly fixed on it. I've always been interested in old houses like this, a strange sort of fondness. Only this house was of a certain variety that I had only seen in movies. I knew you'd love this house. Mom said with excitement and a big smile. It's been years since I've seen it myself, but with how you like those scary movies so much, I knew you would notice it. It was true. The mysterious old house had grabbed my attention and held a firm grasp as it got smaller and smaller through the back window of the car as we accelerated. My head had been completely on a swivel for a second. I was 12 years old, and for those brief moments, the house completely distracted and bewildered me. It was three stories, white with baby blue shutters. There were also two large columns in the front, with little balconies for each of the upstairs windows. I knew nothing about architecture, but it resembled the plantation style, and although it was aged and weathered, it seemed to be in good shape on the outside. It looked extremely out of place though, since most of the surrounding houses in the area were quite a bit smaller and more modern. I've never seen a house like that around here. It's probably the oldest house in the whole county, she said with a good amount of certainty. The yard had been maintained, but it looked lonely. Does anyone live in it? I ask with a genuine look of curiosity on my face. No, no one's lived there for years. It's been like that since I was your age. Me and my friends always thought it was haunted, she said as she popped her gum loudly. Well, what about the owners? Who owns it? I ask. The last I heard, the owner is an old woman who lives in another state. North Carolina, maybe. Or Georgia. I can't remember. My mother was driving me to my friend James' house and I was going to be staying the night for the first time. I had never been there before and other than him telling me it was old, I really didn't know what to expect. Nevertheless, I was excited the whole way there. 
I was eagerly clutching the tied ends of the plastic Walmart bags which contained my collection of video games and gaming magazines that I was quite proud of. My best friend and I had known each other since the second grade, and we had a lot of fun together. We played video games, laughed a lot, watched MTV, and did plenty of exploring outside. We often discussed girls, as most boys did, and we would rank each girl we knew from top to bottom based on looks alone. It was a warm summer evening, and with no clouds in sight, the sun still had plenty of shining to do before the day would be over. Perfect weather to start what was looking to be a fun-filled weekend. James and his family lived about a half mile past the decrepit looking house, and as we took a slight curve around some lumbering oak trees, my eyes caught a sudden glimpse of something huge and white, far off to the right, sitting in the middle of what looked like a large field. It was another towering old home. I soon learned from mom that this is James's house. This is it. I haven't seen this place in forever, she said as she started up the long gravel driveway. I forgot how pretty it was out here. It was Victorian style with a charming yet somewhat unnerving look about it. I had no idea he lived in a house like this, but I was glad he did. I thought it was awesome, and I couldn't wait to check it out. The place had seen better days, with much of the wood siding being riddled and heavily chipped, battle marks and blemishes from well over a hundred years of Mother Nature bearing down on it. Yes, it was that old. I found out that it was built in the late 1800s. The yard was enormous and I remember him telling me that he mowed it with one of those massive cutting blades that were attached to a small trailer with wheels, which he pulled with his four-wheeler, and it made sense to me now. It was peaceful back in this hollow, and it was nestled in the far outskirts of a small southeastern Kentucky town. James and I were distant relatives, and we didn't find this out until after our friendship began. His mom was a first cousin to my grandma, so somewhere down the line this made us cousins. Far off, of course, but we both thought it was great that we were connected through family like this. Mom parked the car at the end of the driveway that wrapped around part of the house and ended close to the back entrance. There was also a large porch here, complete with old-looking chairs and a table. We were parked in front of an above-ground cellar made with concrete blocks, which I would later find out only served as storage room for his dad's beer. A good-sized garden with what appeared to be freshly tilled dirt was situated further back, closer to where the grass met the lofty pine trees at the edge of the woods. When we got out of the car, I looked toward the window next to the porch and saw a still figure of someone peering out at us. It was James. I heard the sliding door open quickly as him and his mom came out to greet us. Why, hello, Pam. How in the world have you been? His mom asked with a smile. Sherry had a warm personality. She was short in stature, wore glasses and kept her hair about shoulder length with plenty of grays peeking through. Hey Sherry, I've been fine. You been okay? It's so pretty out here and I love your house. They were both enthusiastic and exchanged hugs while catching up and talking about the family, as well as Sherry's recent weight loss and how good she looked. Of course she complimented my mom on her looks as well. All the usual pleasantries and gossip between parents. She invited mom to come inside, to which my mom said she wished she could, but had some earlier obligations and time-sensitive errands to run. So we told each other bye and hugged and she left. Just make yourself at home, sweetie, Sherry said, giving me a pat on the back. I've got to go in there and help Charles with something. Charles was James's dad. We stepped through the sliding doors and into the kitchen. James could tell I was just looking around, trying to see all there was to see. He could tell I was interested in this house. Pretty big house, isn't it? He said. Yeah, it's huge. I'd like to see the rest of it. And what about that crazy looking house at the beginning of the road? I've never seen a house like that. I was hoping he'd know some history on the place or maybe some insane rumors that probably weren't true. I love stories about old houses, no matter how ridiculous and exaggerated they usually were. Uh, I've heard that it was built back in the 1800s, like this house. And I also heard that people have died in it, but I don't know, he said. There are a lot of stories about it, but I don't know anyone who's been inside of it. The people who own it live somewhere far off. He started looking through my gaming magazines I brought. I can't believe it hasn't been broken into or destroyed by some of the druggies and thieves around here, I said. He nodded his head in agreement. Yeah, me either. Maybe people are too afraid to mess with it. Come on, I'll show you the rest of the house. Grab your things. I followed him through the house, paying attention to every little detail I could. The room that connected the kitchen to the living room was huge, and it had a treadmill, a deep freezer, and a desktop computer sitting on a desk with a Windows 98 screensaver enabled. In the living room, I see the top of a man's head sitting in a recliner. He was drinking a Budweiser in a can, with all of his attention focused on a boxing match he was watching on TV. He had black hair, looked to be in his late 40s or early 50s, and was skinny. 
We stood next to his chair so I could meet him. He moved his head in our direction and looked at us with the most perplexed look. It was honestly a funny looking expression and almost made me bust out laughing. James breaks the ice. This is Daniel, Dad. You know, Daniel, our cousin. He's probably drunk, James whispered, seeming not to care if the old man heard him or not. Charles finally speaks. Hey, you bastards. Nice to meet you, Daniel. Either of you assholes know how to till a garden? He laughed. He was obviously hammered and he proved James' assumptions to be accurate. I laughed heartily and raised my hand to meet his for a shake. Hey Charles, nice to meet you too. I've helped out in a garden once or twice, but that's about it. I could already tell that I liked him because he was funny. He kept plenty of Budweiser on hand at all times and made funny facial expressions and comments. He wasn't one of those violent alcoholics. James told me this before and I was seeing that now. James had also told me that Charles had been in the Vietnam War and took a bullet to the chin, which was a close encounter with death and left a scar which ran from the center of his chin to the uppermost portion of where his neck began. It was obvious that James was ashamed of his father's alcohol problem and from what I understood, Charles wasn't just a weekend drinker either. He had never been able to kick the habit, which I'm sure had probably created a barrier or put some sort of strain on the family dynamic as it often does. Come on. I'll show you the rest of the house, James said, motioning me through the living room to the steep staircase. This is my mom and dad's room, he said as he pointed to a large room next to the staircase. It was carpeted and had what appeared to be a king-size bed. It wasn't the tidiest looking room and it had two piles of clothes lying around. I noticed another computer in the corner. This hallway next to the stairs goes to the bathroom and my bedroom is upstairs. You want to go up and play some games? Yeah, let's go, I said. We head up the steep staircase and as we step on the linoleum of the second floor, I notice how old and tattered it is and what looked like pieces of newspaper or something underneath. I bent down to get a closer look and that's exactly what it was. Bits and pieces of newspapers. These weren't just any newspapers though, they were dated as far back as the 1800s. I came across several larger sections that were left intact with random dates and articles. I pulled the papers out just enough to where I could read them without taking them out completely from underneath the flooring. Although as old and torn as it was, I doubt it really mattered. Gosh, look at all these papers, I said. These are news articles from over a century ago. James who was several steps ahead of me turned around and smiled. Yeah, I know. There are hundreds of them under all the flooring up here. They used it as some type of insulation, I think, but I don't know who put them there. None of the news articles that I saw were particularly interesting or noteworthy, but I thought it was cool anyway. I hadn't known of anyone doing this before. Do you know they used to have a public court in our yard a long time ago? There have been people hanged before, right in our front yard. James said this as he was plugging the Sony PlayStation into the back of a big floor model TV. No way. Are you serious? How do you know? I ask inquisitively. Historical society. We've seen pictures and everything. It was literally right in our front yard. I forgot how many hangs there were, but I know it was a lot. That's insane, I say. I liked horror movies and all this was a lot to take in. Everything from the house at the beginning of the road to the house I was now standing in, to the history of the land. It was a lot for me to think about. I loved it. Before we sat down to play a game called Silent Hill, which was supposed to be a horror lover's dream, I noticed this room had tan colored carpet and an old wooden door on the opposite end of the room, which led to a large porch that overlooked the whole front yard and driveway. The sun had started its evening routine of slowly hiding itself behind the mountains before completely leaving the darkness, the moon and the night stars to fill the land. An evening view that I would find to be beautiful is in front of me. A large tobacco field, exquisitely maintained, with the brownest, richest looking dirt providing a more than adequate home for the roots of the vibrant, deep green leaves sprouting above. A cool breeze is sweeping through, an inviting briskness across my cheeks. I stare out at the land once more, take one deep breath into my lungs, exhale, and make my way back into the bedroom, where James has already started playing the game. I sat down in front of the TV, the bright glow beaming on me and watched him play for a bit. The lights were off and it took my eyes a minute to adjust. I could already tell the game was dark, creepy, and intense. After about an hour, we saved our progress and switched over to another game. I was snapping the Silent Hill game case closed when I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. Staring into the doorway with the steps getting nearer, I watched for someone to appear. Gradually illuminated by the television glow, a recognizable face came into view. You boys want something to eat? I've got meatloaf, green beans, mashed potatoes, and cornbread on the table. 
I've got a peanut butter pie for dessert. Better hurry before Charles eats it all. It was Sherry, James's mom. I was starving and with each of the things she listed, my stomach seemed to growl with approval. She flipped the light on in the upstairs hallway and we followed her to the stairs. As we passed to the other upstairs bedroom, which I hadn't paid attention to on the way up, she pointed inside. Lord, this room is a mess. Just look over it, Daniel. We've more or less just started using it as a junk room since nobody ever goes in there. I couldn't see much in the room. It was indeed messy though, with random things scattered about. It was dark, but right before my eyes turned away and moved onto the stairs, I noticed a big square piece of wood that had apparently been nailed into the wall of the dark, cluttered room. I wondered what that was for. The smell of home cooking filled my nostrils as we made our way to the kitchen table. I wanted to ask James what that piece of wood was for, but I felt weird asking in front of his parents, so I didn't say anything. We sat down at the table as Sherry filled our plates with food. If it tasted as good as it looked, I was in for a treat. Most of the dinner time discussion revolved around how my grandparents were doing, plans for the summer, and Sherry trying to apologize for Charles' random drunken and slightly inappropriate comments. Although to me, Charles was funny. The things he said were no more disturbing than what James and I had talked about on a regular basis, but of course our parents didn't know about that. We all laughed and talked pretty much the whole time, but as I washed down my food with some water, I heard a loud noise that sounded like it came from the upstairs. It was a thump, like something had fallen over. We all heard it, and his parents brushed it off. This house makes noises like that all the time, Charles said, just before wiping his mouth with a napkin. When dinner was over, I thanked them both for the food, and James and I rushed back up the stairs to dive into some more video games. Just as I got to the top of the staircase, I remembered the dark room and I took another peek in. I stood there in dismay and confusion as I peered into the room. Something was not the same. The rectangular large piece of wood that had just been on the wall before dinner was now gone. Hey James, I called ahead to him. Come here a sec. Wasn't there a piece of wood on the wall in this room? Now it's just a hole. James came over to where I was standing, walked into the room and flipped on the light switch. Come over here and look, he said, motioning me to join him. I don't know why this happens. I know I nailed the board on there, but it always does this. Falls back down. He pointed to the floor where the piece of wood was now laying. This is what the noise during dinner came from. Why is there a big hole here in the wall? I asked. He gave me a serious look. Well, we don't hardly ever come in here, so I didn't think to tell you before, but there's another room on the other side of this hole. Another room? I asked, confused. Hold on a second, let me get a flashlight. I'll show you, he said. I could hear him running into his bedroom to get the light, as I kept looking into the dark hole in the wall, trying to get a glimpse of something, anything. He came back into the room and bent down next to me. He handed me the flashlight. Here, take a look, he said. I gripped the flashlight in my hand, feeling the cold, cylindrical metal body of the maglite in my sweaty palm. I was excited yet nervous as I pointed it toward the darkness within the hole and clicked the button down to engage the beam of light. Wow, it's huge, I said. It was a big, unfinished room. I couldn't see much in it except some pieces of wood laying on the floor and the ceiling, which was slanted on both sides and came to a point. Why wasn't it finished? Why isn't there an actual door? I asked. Someone told my mom and dad that the man who built the house was never able to finish this room, he said. He died in it. I stared at him for a second, waiting for him to tell me he was just pulling my leg. But he was either a master of poker faces or he was telling the truth. How did he die? I asked. I heard that he had a massive heart attack in this room and he died instantly. But that's just what my parents heard, he said. I didn't put much thought into the boards coming loose from the wall and neither did he. I guess we both just assumed that there was a logical explanation behind it. We were both fascinated with anything concerning the paranormal, and a real-life first-hand experience with it would be welcomed, granted that it didn't involve any personal or physical harm to either of us. Our skepticism of the supernatural ran deep, but our questioning minds wanted to be challenged and pushed. Even at our age, we knew more than a handful of people who seemed to believe with every bone in their body that they had indeed been confronted with the paranormal. Any logical or rational explanations had been discarded by them. My skeptic tendencies made it hard for me to put much faith into these claims, however, and until I could fully vouch for an occurrence like that, I would always doubt their validity. I asked James if there had been anything strange happening in the house, to which he replied in a way that wasn't a definitive yes or no. 
He did say that there had always seemed to be unexplained noises coming from the unfinished room, at random times, but in a routinely manner. Noises that sounded like someone walking around upstairs. Nothing that would ever be considered menacing or threatening though, and perhaps could even have a logical explanation upon any level of simple investigating. I nevertheless thought it was remarkably interesting, and I felt compelled to sit and discuss it further. But I knew that this was where James had lived all of his life, and that he was used to these things, so I decided to switch gears and cool down on the enthusiastic probing. It was still early in the night and we had more games to play, so we put the boards back, making sure that they were secure enough not to fall before heading back into his room. Dim light slowly leaks into the small spaces between my eyelids as the room around me comes into view. I'm awakened by a sound. What sort of sound? Where was the sound coming from? I didn't know yet. I think to myself that I must have fallen asleep on the floor at some point. As I raise myself up and glance down at my watch, it's too dark to read the dial. My head is pounding and my mouth is dry, which is probably a result from the awkward sleeping position and possible snoring that I was often guilty of. The TV, which is the only light source in the room, is filled with fuzz yet completely silent. Everything is quiet. Not even the faint sounds of the old house settling or even the wind outside is audible. The door that leads to the upstairs porch is open, but I can hear no crickets, frogs, or anything. I wondered why no one woke me up so that I could at least get in bed, but James wasn't in his bed either. I was debating on heading downstairs when I heard another noise that stopped me in my tracks. It was James. He was calling my name. Yeah? Where are you? I ask. He didn't respond. It was hard for me to tell where it came from, but it sounded close. It couldn't have possibly been coming from all the way downstairs, but more nearby. Perhaps the upstairs hallway or room with the boards. I turn on the light in the bedroom, and it casts plenty of light on the upstairs hallway, and I don't see James. I make my way further down the hall, getting closer to the entrance of the other room, and again, I hear, Daniel, 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 where are you? I speak louder, demanding an answer. Entering the dark room, I pull the light switch, and a sudden wave of chills creeps down my spine. I can feel every individual hair on my arms stand up. The boards on the wall that we had secured were gone. The hole into the unfinished room appeared much larger to me. No longer was its accessibility limited to smaller sized individuals. It didn't make sense to me, but it had noticeably expanded. As I walked closer to the hole in the wall, the most disturbing thing became clear. The boards were not lying just below the hole on the floor, as if they had simply fallen. They were all scattered on the other side of the room, making it look as though they had been knocked loose from the other side, from inside the hidden room. Were the voices coming from that room? It made no sense, and even though my eagerness to go any closer to investigate was at an all-time low, I wanted to confront my fear. I hesitantly looked into the darkness of the hole. Hello? James? Are you in there? I said in a raspy, whispered tone. I didn't want to hear an answer from here. I wanted to go downstairs and see James getting a snack from the kitchen, laughing at me for getting all spooked by his joke. I would then join in on the laughing, use a few profanities towards him, and all would be well. My eyes opened up like golf balls and my heart sank as blood violently rushed through my veins. Something answered me. Daniel, Daniel, what are you doing in there? A bright light is shining in my eyes and I immediately know the voice. It's Sherry. Are you okay? She asked. I'm gasping for air, my heart pounding as though I've just ran a marathon and I'm entirely drenched in sweat. I look around, still trying to understand what's going on. Had I been dreaming? Had I got up in my sleep to come to this room? She's waiting for my response. I'm okay, but I don't know what's going on, I said. I don't remember falling asleep or coming in here. It's two in the morning, honey, and Chester and I both woke up from you yelling, in your sleep, I guess. I had no idea where it was coming from. Is James in here with you? Was James in here with me? I had no idea. I remembered nothing about coming in here. My mind was blank. I can't see anything, I said. Be careful coming out of there. There's pieces of wood stacked up next to you, she warned, shining the light on the pile of two by four planks at my feet, directing my eyes with it. It took me a minute to gather myself, wiping the thick coat of dust off of my clothes that had already began to accumulate. How long had I been asleep in here? 
Had my previous intrigue with this room been the driving force behind me sleepwalking into it? I must have fallen asleep on the floor and then for some reason got up and come to this room. I had a dream about it too. A crazy dream, I said. I stood up and looked around the dark room. So James isn't in his room? Where would he be this late? I don't know, but I've checked every place in the house other than this room. We've never come in this room, so I didn't think he'd be in here. I'm starting to get worried. Come on out, I'm going to go downstairs and look for him outside. I can tell she's getting nervous and I can hear the sound of her shoes hitting each step on the way down. I decide to make my way out when I see another flashlight laying on the ground, just outside the opening. Even though James is missing, my mind shifts to the dream I had earlier. I could vividly remember something answering me from inside here, but I can't recall what it was. I'm almost certain, however, that it wasn't James. The voice seemed to be much deeper than his and it was almost like a whisper. Definitely a male voice, and one that I wasn't familiar with at all. It said something that had startled me, something unsettling enough to make me scream in my sleep. But what was it? I know I can think of it if I keep trying. I can hear Sherry now, and Charles too. Both their voices filled with worry and concern. They're both screaming out into the night in hopes of a response. I pick up the flashlight and turn it on, determined to thoroughly examine this room, even with my lingering fear very much present and growing, thanks to this mysteriously chilling dream I had, I feel a sense of urgency to remember what that voice said, the possible importance of it prodding inside my mind. I have an idea, although the resulting reaction could very well send me fleeing downstairs in a panic. I was going to ask for an answer, just as I had asked in my dream. It was a crazy assumption to assume that since I heard a voice in my dream that I would hear a voice in real life, but my imagination would get the best of me and I would ask anyway. I walk around the room, shining the light on everything I can. There is what appears to be a little area for a closet but with no door, a space made into the wall with plenty of room on the left or right for clothes to hang or things to be stored. Not really knowing what to ask, I settle for, is there anyone in here? And wait. A few seconds go by and nothing. The only sound I can hear is Sherry and Charles downstairs, frantically scrambling around desperate to find their son. I turn around to sweep the room with light one final time and immediately notice something that wasn't there a few moments before. Now lying on the wood floor in front of me was a newspaper clipping. It was undeniably old and discolored, but the headline of the article was in large black print and still quite legible. Local carpenter and daughter killed in brutal murder under investigation. A quiet community is in a state of shock this week after town authorities uncover a grisly crime scene involving the murder of a well-respected citizen and his young daughter. Police say the crime took place inside the home of William Brock, age 38. Upon further investigation, it appears to have been an entirely random break-in, as William was finishing up a room that would eventually be his own daughter's, who also perished in the violent attack. There are no suspects at this time and any information regarding this will help aid the police in the ongoing pursuit of justice for William and his daughter Emily. The disturbing article was followed by a picture of the Victorian style home. Newly built, its pristine beauty is pictured now forever tarnished by this cloud of darkness. A savage act of brutality had once occurred in the very room I now stood in. I folded the article with trembling sweaty hands and put it into my pants pockets. I direct my flashlight towards the exit to make my escape, but wait, what the hell? The hole is now covered with the boards, denying me of a way out. I feel like death is imminent for me as I kick the boards and scream for James's parents. The wooden boards feel like concrete and I begin to realize that any attempt to loosen or break them is useless. Where are James's parents? My anxiety is out of control and my fight or flight switch has flipped. The idea of turning around is petrifying to me, but I do anyway, while preparing to use my metal flashlight as a weapon. I spin around, my weapon raised and shining in front of me, when I'm met with a force that freezes my entire body. I instantly lose my grip on the light as the heavy body of it collides with the floor. I'm trying to move with every bit of strength in me, but I can't. I can't even move an inch. It's claustrophobic. The feeling of being awake and aware of your surroundings but completely unable to move. I'm going to die in this room, I thought, waiting for that moment of blunt force trauma to drop me to my knees. Or perhaps it would be painless. Either way, 
At that moment, I thought it was inevitable, but it never happened. Instead, the same voice I had heard earlier in my dream, the voice with the message I couldn't remember, spoke to me. Helpless and terrified, I had no choice but to listen in horror. Leave our home. Your friend's bloodline took what wasn't theirs. The evil doing of their ancestors they now benefit from. But not for long. I am now let loose from the arms of the dead, seemingly spared, although James's parents may not be so lucky. I waste no time getting to the exit as I witness the barricaded wood now being removed. It is only now as I make my successful escape that I remember the voice from the dream and the message it gave me. My little girl wanted a friend. That's all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed that collection of scary stories. Be sure to stick around for volume two. So until next time, everyone take care, be safe, and above all, stay scared.